What do we do with Expedia? First a little Expedia spiel, then I'll hand it over to, to Jack, probably. Uh, so Expedia, our ambition is to revolutionize travel um, through the power of technology. And for us, it's equally important about what we're building uh, and how we build it. So we, one of our challenges is we're a reasonably seasoned company. We've been around for about 20 years. Uh, we spin out from Microsoft. Today, we're completely technology agnostic, which you, we let our engineers choose the technologies they want to work on. And also, some of the initiatives are actually driven within the team. And accessibility is very important for us. And it's as much driven from within the team as it is driven as a program within the company. Um, I think that's about it. Here's Jack Armley. He's going to talk about accessibility. Jack is in our client-side engineering team. He's one of our champions here in London for accessibility. Uh, yeah, welcome, Jack. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Jerry's made it easier for me. I don't really have to do the intro slide, but I will anyway. I say my name is Jack, there's my desk. Ignore the bottle of whiskey, though. Um, so, yeah, as Jeremy said, I'm a front end developer at Expedia on the CAC team. Uh, if you've been to our last talk with Dave, Dave is also on our CAC team, which is sort of that there. Um, I work on the UI toolkit. It's a set of components, so from topography, buttons, I'm a date pick here, which we're very proud of. Um, so by here. All these components, and these are available for use across all of Expedia's brands and products. If you use it, Orbits, Travelocity, and then Expedia itself. Um, so, tonight we're going to be talking about increased design, my favourite thing to talk about. Um, I won't go on for too long, but this is the, the basic summary. We're going to be talking what increased design is, and then we're going to be kind of uh, firming up in our minds what a disability is, because we're going to be talking about using disabilities first and foremost. And then we're going to uh, define a tool set that we can use to include users with a disability in our, in our experiences. Uh, and then second half, we're going to be all demo, demo, demo. So let's talk about me. So before I get proper into it, set you guys a little challenge. So I'm going to go to this, uh, this URL here. And the uh, first person to tell me the yeah, movie this quote from gets another free beer. Alright, <laughs> can anyone tell me what movie that quote? Anyone? Alright, I was being a bit cruel there, that was a big, massive trick. Well done. <laughs> um, there is a quote in there, but it's made specifically for visually impaired users uh, using a stream viewer. That's a tool that they've used for accessing the, the a website. So, in this instance, I've cut all you guys out of this experience and I've built an exclusive experience just for one set of users. That's what we want to avoid doing uh, with inclusive design. Um, so that's a little bit of uh, what you'd experience if you had a visual impairment if you go to a website to build the wrong way. Um, so we'll start by defining what inclusive design is. Um, so the British Standards Institute puts it pretty well. Um, it's the uh, design of products that are accessible to and usable by as many people as reasonably possible. And here's the key bit, without special adaption or specialized design. So, this is my favourite example here. I don't know how many of you guys have noticed that there's Braille on, on bus stop signs. Um, so instead of having five different stop signs, one for each height of person, one for a visually impaired user, you know, one for a man, one for a lady, whatever else you want to go, they've got one stop sign here. You can see a few features here. You've got it's like a like a round shape. So if you're feeling a pole, if you're visually impaired, for example, you feel where that button is, and you've got some Braille underneath the, the stop words here, which are pretty cool. Um, the stop hasn't been written in like Comic sound or some kind of script font to be written in really clear sans serif, capitalised, very easy to see. Uh, and it's in red, which is certainly in, in our culture here in this country, it's a universal sign to stop. I'm sure if you go to other countries, other countries it would be a different colour. Um, so I, I, I like the word inclusive uh, when we're talking about uh, including use with disabilities. Uh, why haven't I not used the word accessibility? Well, because, as it says here on Wikipedia, I don't know how accurate Wikipedia is. It's the design of products uh, and services for people with disabilities. And for me, it's kind of a good and a bad word because it kind of means that a lot of the time, if you build a website and then you get to the end and then you go, ah, oh, damn, visually impaired users, let's put that bit in at the very end. So what we're going to try and do is include all these users from the beginning, from the get-go. So we've got kind of, a, to figure out how this applies to websites, we've got four typical users here. We've got a, 
your desktop user here, let's assume they're on a fast Wi-Fi connection like we've got here sometimes, <laughs> most of the time. Um, we've got a mobile user here, and as you know, being on trains and whatnot, mobiles can go from pretty fast to absolutely dire. Um, we've got a, uh, a keyboard-only user, so this user may have a motor, motor skill impairment, which means that they can't use the mouse necessarily, they have to use the keyboard to navigate the website. And then uh, bottom, bottom right here, we've got a visually impaired user using a screen reader. This is a tool that they use for accessing the internet. And we, we're going to go through uh, what a screen reader is uh, later on. So we want to include all those users with one site rather than having multiple different sites for each use case. Um, so what we need to do, we've got to tick these two things off each time, right? We want to understand the user, and then we, can, we need to replicate their experience in some way. So we have some kind of empathy. We have those users in the, in the front of our minds when we're building our websites. Uh, so let's take these top two users as an example, because I'm sure we've all worked on these kind of uh, use cases here. Uh, so we want to avoid this example here. This is a BBC website from 2005. I don't know if any of you guys remember this kind of this kind of jazz, you know, text only edition, mobile only edition. So what we're doing here is we're asking the user to load this big clunky page, and then we're saying, hey, you want a mobile phone? Oh, find this link, and they go off to your mobile website. Or um, and then we're asking text only websites. So you've got to figure out whether you're that type of user or not. So not an ideal experience. Something we want to kind of avoid. Fortunately, these days. Uh, we've got all these fancy smancy techniques. It's a great time to be a front end developer. We've got a responsive design through media queries. I don't know if you guys have media queries before. Uh, we've got um, image compression, we've got caching, we've got uh, responsive images, all these things, which means we can serve one site from the biggest desktop to the smallest mobile phone rather than sending people off to those different things. Um, and these things are easily testable. This is a Chrome DevTools. Probably you've seen this, actually, the contrast on that's really bad. Um, we, we can emulate different devices, different orientations, touch devices, all this kind of stuff. With throttling, we can emulate edge connections, 3G, 4G, all this kind of thing. So, really <coughs> easy to kind of figure out kind of how the user is experiencing the site so we can avoid alienating. So, in this respect, we've ticked off these two things. Understood our users, because we all have phones, we all use computers, uh, and we can replicate their experience take the phone out of our pocket, go on our computer, easy, easy. Um, so how about these bottom two users? So um, we've got a keyboard only user, as I say, and our streamer user. So we need to do the same things. We need to understand what kind of user they are and we need to replicate their experience. Right? Want to avoid this? Can you anyone guess what year this website's from? Can anyone see the problem with it? It's the Amazon website. Again. All right. 2016. Huh? 2016. 2016. It's the correct answer, and that's not a plant. I think it's not a plant. That's a um, <laughs> this is from 2016, so what we're asking for users to do here was saying, get to the end of this big sign-up form, go past the notoriously annoying capture, which are never the best thing for visually impaired users, and then, oh, hey, having trouble with sign impaired, click this link. So I just spent half an hour going through this form and then I've got to click this link. The real pain, something we want to really, really want to avoid. I feel like giving Amazon a ring, probably wouldn't get through to them really. Mm -hmm. um, so the first thing we need to do, we need to think about that list again. Step one, we need to understand our users, right? So let's start by thinking about what disability is. Okay, so UK government does a good one. Obviously they're probably good better than a Wikipedia to go to. Um, so they say that uh, you're disabled if you have a physical or mental impairment that has a substantial and long-term effect or negative effect on your ability to do normal daily activities. So for example, for me, my vision impairment is easily correctable. If I wear glasses every day, then no problem. But if I forgot my glasses at home for the day, I would effectively be disabled. I would have to turn my screen reader on. I wouldn't be able to see my computer screen properly. Um, there are many different types of disabilities. Um, so the ones we're going to look at today, we're going to look at blindness and low vision, and we're going to look at limited movements and motor skill impairments. But you can see there, there's a, a big list here. Deafness and hearing loss, learning uh, disabilities, so dyslexia, like I have here, uh, cognitive limitations, speech disabilities. And all of these people use our website, they'll use your websites, you know, we want to make sure we don't cut these users out. Uh, they're not a small amount of users either. From the NHS here, uh, almost 2 million people living with sight loss in the UK. I think about 
maybe a core of those are registered as blind or partially sighted. So not everyone identifies as such. It's a lot of users to cut out our experience again. Um, great uh, quote by Eon Time here, they make this really cool watch. Because I really like it. <laughs> um, uh, they're saying that um, we've got to remember that people with disabilities uh, also includes anyone who might become disabled at any point in life through injury, disease, or the process of aging, and that potentially is all of us, right? Um, when we do our accessibility training uh, here at Expedia, we think of this as these three categories here. So you can have a permanent, a temporary, or acquired disability. Right? Important to remember this. Okay, so for example, with visually impaired users, uh, I could be born with blindness, right? I could forget my glasses for the day. And I'm effectively visually impaired. I made that mistake in a pool, I couldn't find the locker. Tip for you. Um, or I could get poor vision with age, which will likely happen to quite a few of us. Um, I could be born with dyspraxia, that's kind of a, a motor based disease, makes it hard to plan and coordinate physical movement. I could fall and break my arm, so for the next couple of months, however long it takes my arm to heal, I've got to use a keyboard. I then become that keyboard user we saw on the bottom left there. Or I could develop arthritis later on in life, and I could, my physical movements could get. So and whatnot, and I have to then change the way that I access the internet. Equally, could be born with dyslexia. Uh, could be learning a new subject. Could be learning French. If someone speaks French, I mean, real quick. I'm not going to try and speak French. Yeah, croissant. Maybe <laughs> exactly. Um, I, I will be able to follow on the conversation. So to be inclusive, they'll have to slow down and, uh, and speak so for me. Um, or I'll, I could be able to measure, for example, when I'm older, find it difficult, more difficult to process things. So. Very yeah, important to remember that you know, we could all become temporarily disabled at some point, so we don't want to cut these pieces out. So there we've kind of we've kind of checked that first point. We've gone some way to understand this group of users. They've gone from kind of an abstract group of people to a real group of people as much as we can. Um, now, so in our chapter two, let's get to this next part. So we've gone through these two bits: what's a disability, what's inclusive design. So now we're going to, we've got to develop some kind of a tool set, some kind of a way of empathizing and understanding these users and experiencing the website through their, through their uh, tools and the way they use it. Uh, the left hand uh, example here, the keyboard only user, that's pretty simple. All we need to do, don't throw your mouse away, put it in the drawer. Um, you can do, th I've heard of people doing things like they take coins to the bottom of your knuckles so that you have, uh, your, your imitating uh, kind of uh, limited movement. Do those kind of things, and you can use the website as you would use if you were a, a keyword only user. Uh, the right hand user, this um, visually impaired user, is using a screen reader. So, for that, we need to understand a little bit of what a screen reader is. So, a screen reader um, is an assistive technology. So, just like my glasses are an assistive technology, uh, they augment uh, an experience to make it easier to use, so to kind of level the playing field, as it were. So, a screen reader here. You get them on your phones, you get them on your computers, um, through touch or through um, keyboard uh, commands, you can navigate your way through the website uh, and bring that experience as close as possible as you can to a, to a <coughs> visual user. Um, there are other types of assistive technology. You've got a um, large print keyboard cover here, it's pretty cool. You have like low vision, you could use that, make the keyboard easy to see. You may get that just in case I forget my glasses. You've got here, you've got a screen magnifier here. There's actually kind of a thing for watching movies on, but equally you can use it to screen magnifier and make your screen easy to see. So they're all assistive technologies. Um, so we can use a screen reader. That's one way that we can replicate the experience and understand how user experiences our site. The second thing is we, it's good to have kind of a checklist, kind of a framework to work within so we know what to look for when we're going through our site and going through our page and things. And that's where uh, Wicca comes in. Has anyone used Wicca? Has anyone read through it? Has anyone fallen asleep to everybody? Okay. Um, so let's quickly skim through what Wicca is. Uh, it stands for the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Uh, they were revised in 2008, so they're now Wicca 2. And everything was 2.0. Um, it's basically like a huge range of recommendations for making web content more accessible to a wider range of people with disabilities, right? So, to make it a little bit easier, a little bit less arduous, uh, we've got four principles here that they've split it into. Uh, Twelve guidelines and all four principles. Um, I'm going to go through it um, in a kind of simple kind of a way. So, principle number one, we can see it as 
can I find it? So in this example here, I've got the BBC website. I want to go and, go and do a search. So as a visual user, um, or as on our test in the States as a light dependent user, which I think is quite good, um, I can see the search box there on the top right. It says search, it's got a magnifying glass in it, very conventional, very simple to find, very obvious. So in the workout guidelines, the way that it is framed is, can I do the same thing with a screen reader? Can I do the same thing if I'm using a keyboard? Will I be able to find that search box? That's how we keep those things in mind, okay? Uh, second principle here, okay, I've typed in trumping, this is a bit old, trumping's gone now. It's Pokemon Go now, but anyway. Um, principle number two is can I use it? So once, once I've found that search box, can I type my search query in? You can see that I'm getting a sort of complete list here, no, nothing about trumping on BBC. Um, but as a visual user, I could click on one of those search suggestions pretty easily. Um, see what it is. Um, can I do the same thing with a screen reader or can I do the same thing as a keyboard user? Will I, will I just completely miss those suggestions? Third um, one is, print on number three, uh, understandable. So once I get to those search results, I can see there's a filter here, I can see the results underneath if the page is longer. Um, can I understand what, what to do, what will happen? So as a screen reader user, again, as a keyboard user, will I have that equivalent experience to what I have here? And then the fourth one is, is largely a technical uh, guideline. This is all to do with, essentially, um, a screen reader is a robot, a browser is a robot. These things don't understand presentational attributes. They're not going to look at a heading that's 24 points and go, oh, that's a big heading, or a button that's running, oh, that's an important button. They need all the stuff underneath the markup of HTML to be well-formed uh, in order for them to understand that page. So really important, and that's what that principle concentrates on. Um, and all the guidelines within these principles, you've got three levels of compliance. I'm sure you guys have all seen these before, these, these single, double, triple A's. A uh, single A is like the bare minimum that you do to say, if you were to go to a manager and say, I've made this website accessible, you could get away with it, with a, with a single A. But you're not going to provide an equitable experience. It's not going to be the same. It's going to be like a pretty hard to use, technically usable. Uh, double A is what we go for. You'll find what most companies go for. Um, that's then doing the single A stuff and then doing that bit extra to bring it up and make those two experiences uh, kind of match. Um, and that's achievable on most modern websites. So with many of rich interactions like tabs and accordions and all that kind of jazz. Um, the third one, really, really hard to hit if you've got a website that you're, you're building for not possessor users, so visually paid users, not <coughs> skilled users, and uh, visual users. You'll find it really hard to hit AAA. <coughs> maybe you've got a page of, page of text, maybe. Um, so we'll have a quick look at what this looks like. Super boring. I won't get on for too long. Um, so you've got the principle up here. Uh, see? And then, um, oh yeah, the contrast is off the principle there. Go down underneath, so principle one, go down one, one. And then you've got your uh, recommendations underneath. Um, they all have a level. You can see, you can just make out that A there. Level A. Really cool design as well. Um, and then to the right, we've got some uh, technical guidelines of how to meet it. So if you go to that how to meet things, it will give you a few tips how to make a guideline better. So the point is really that we use these two things together in order to um, keep these users in the frame, in order to um, uh, try and experience the website as, as a visually impaired or most of impaired user. So if we just use WebKay, we're going to see it as a bit of a checklist. It's going to become quite arduous. Those users will go right out of our frame line. Um, so it's, you need to use them both together. So, time for the demo. Let me uh, so grab a beer real quick while I just change my display. Where am I spacing? Right. That one's smooth. Look at that. Um, okay. So, <coughs> we're looking at our, uh, our screen we're using here. Um, so, first thing we're going to do is make a tool, find, use the same tools that they'll be using. We've got um, a mobile screen reader here, but we've got lots to choose from. So, there's a screen reader for pretty much every platform. So, if you've got, so you've got two here, you've got NVDA and JAWS, they're for Windows. NVDA is free, we use it with Firefox, that's the kind of recommended pairing. You've got JAWS, it's a little bit expensive. Um, we use that with Internet Explorer, they've been around for a while, but I think they're kind of starting to lose market share because 
fully one pair, it's actually getting really good. Um, you can use Jaws on, on a trial basis if you download it, you can use it for like 40 minutes if you need to restart your computer. So you can have a look, have a little play with it. Um, VoiceOver, that comes pre-installed, so I'm going to be using VoiceOver today because it's like right there. That's on your iPhone, on your iMac, MacBook Pro, whatever. Um, and that's a, for use with Safari. If you use it with something like Chrome, you'll find that Chrome's accessibility API isn't great, so you may come up against bugs that aren't actually there. And then TalkBack for Android, I won't go too much into TalkBack because it's not brilliant. But um, yeah, if you've got an Android, give TalkBack a try. Um, so yeah, we're going to be using VoiceOver today. So before using VoiceOver, um, our accessibility tester Toby says that it's actually a typical practice for VoiceOver users to do the same here. So um, for some reason, Apple's decided that Tab no longer tabs through your web page, it tabs through the Chrome in your browser. So if you change the setting in your advanced settings there, you'll change tab back to what it does normally. So I always do that beforehand. Uh, and then we've got a few basic commands here. So contrary to what kind of some people think, maybe you've got a lot more than the tab key on screen readers. You can traverse through every arm on your web page. So the first thing you do is start voiceover up. So we've got uh, command F5, that's start voiceover. And then we've got the uh, voiceover key. So that key, when you press control and alt, that's saying this is a voiceover command, right? So because some things are reserved for the operating system. So you've got to become a little bit of a piano player to kind of figure some of these out, but we'll get there. Uh, so the one thing we're using today, move to the start of the document. So you start out on the browser chrome, and then this will move you into the document. So that's voiceover, so control, alt, shift, <laughs> down arrow. That will move you to the start of your document. And then you can move item by item, voiceover and left and right arrows. So you move from domino to domino on your page. Then you've got this cool thing here called the rotor, which I'll save as a little soprano for a few minutes. Now. That's very, very cool. Um, you've got the equivalent thing on MVDA, you've got the equivalent thing on JAWS and on voiceover. Um, there are lots of other things you can do. Skip by heading, skip by form control, all kind of cool stuff. But we're going to concentrate on those basic things for now. Um, this is what I do. I like to waste a few trees every now and then. If you want to learn these commands, the easiest way to do it is to print them out. Just print them out and stick them on your desk. If you go to WebAIM, Web Accessibility in Mind, that's a really awesome resource for just getting some really good cheat sheets. Use some uh, cool pink pens or whatever, I like the ones you're going to use to stick on your desk. Much easier than flipping between kind of a, a, a website and your, and your work. Uh, so, we've hit our screen here, now let's go through our Golden Rules now, but before we do, we're going to have a little tour of, of VoiceOver, right? So uh, let's go to man. Spoilers. Uh, <laughs> okay. Here it is. By the way, all these are on code names, as you can probably tell. So I'll, I'll link to that. Later. So here we've got our a typical page here. We've got some links. We've got some uh, form and, and whatnot. Um, as a keyboard only user. As you probably know, I can tab through, you can see the focus there in orange. You don't, we don't normally change the focus stars, by the way. Uh, you can tab through form controls, buttons, and links. Right? That's, that's the way you can get to with the, with the keyboard. With the screen reader, you've got a lot more. So if I can even remember how to start it, please. One dog. No, uh, five. 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 Ah, good. Right, you will get a gold star. Uh, okay. Voice over on Safari, Pro T, Android Screen Readers Window, Resident Link, MVDA has two of this. We are currently on the link. So there we go. Control um, not in space. Okay. So first of all, I'm going to do Control Alt, which is my voiceover key. Shift and down. Interactive, Resident Link, Menu, Size Items, Closing Menu, Blade Windows. So you can see already what it's doing is it's saying I'm on heading level two. It's already we're seeing when we're using a stream reader, if we haven't got the correct markup, we're going to know pretty damn quick because it's not going to see this is a big heading, this is a small heading. It's just going to go, oh, that's heading level two. So awesome thing to test uh, with. So voiceover and right. Yes, right. Delete, 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 for Android, for key is different. You are per others, like JAWS for Windows, cost a significant amount of money. Yeah, we know you are currently on a text chain Um Okay, so now I can go open up my rotor. It's pretty cool, so control alt U. Linux menu. 
So you can see what it's done there is it's, is it's gathering all the links together in one list. So I can just skip through them real quick. Just like people read magazines, you think people go from the front to the back, they actually go front, back, middle. Screen readers really will get to your page and they'll, they'll do, use these techniques to very quickly find what they want to look for. Headings menu. So you've got headings. Heading, 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 menu to four controls menu. Four controls. Oh, no, 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 menu. Landmark, section of five landmarks. Windows, stop, links menu. So. Others, like jobs for windows, cost of voice over off. So there we go. There's a few things there, but you can see very quickly that it, it will really, really use for highlighting cracks in, in, our, in our page here. So let's have a look at our first golden rule here. Let me just have a more equivalent. So I think I've now knocked my notes. So I've got keys. Um, this is in, uh, let's see. Yeah, this is in uh, our perceivable um, principle, if you remember the first one. And this is a, this is a single A kind of guideline here. Uh, so let's have a look. So it basically says that any graphics you have, how to have more equivalent. So if you're using a screen reader if you're using Lewis, you have to be able to figure out what the image is without looking at it. So you can see here, obviously the best movie ever made. And um, we've got four images of the dude here, uh, Big Lebowski, and that's the beginning of the movie when you're shopping for milk. Uh, all look the same to us. Let's have a look what a screen reader makes of it, right? So again, Command F5, turn my screen reader. Okay, so we're on Safari. Images so have a normal equivalent for screen readers window. So I'm going to go to my first image. So I'm going to go to my first Halloween dash one dash one dash one dash dash one 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 dash Technically, we put alt text in, so I don't know if you guys know what alt text is. It's a little, little te um, line of text you can put on your image uh, to make sure that the you know, screen is in the center. So that's technically got alt text on, but it's not very helpful at all. Let's go on to the next one here. Still from the movie, the Dave Ladoski showing Jeff Ladoski standing in the mini marked area and holding a card in his little image. You are currently on an image. Voice over off. So you can see there already, by using a screen reader, I can start to imagine what it feels like. To use uh, to have images with kind of unhelpful alt text or, or no alt text at all. Let's see what this actually is doing. Uh, or turn it on here. Uh, so first one here, we've got no alt text at all. So it's starting to read out the image source. So this thing, this bit here, start to read out this image source as the name of the image. Not very helpful. Second one, we have an alt empty alt text string. So it skipped right past it. That image is effectively invisible to the screen reader. And a third one. Uh, yeah, we've got the unhelpful alt text. S still alt text, but not the most helpful. And then the fourth one, of course, we've got a very helpful descriptive alt text. Um, so, let's just get that out of the way. So, yeah, benefits of this. Uh, obviously, screen reader users can make out and draw your images. Uh, and also, you, you always have knock-on effects of doing these things. So robots like Google Images and whatnot, will they be able to, to actually pass your images more effectively? Uh, so you've got another rule here, it links make sense out of context. So let's have a look at what this one is. So this is, right here. This is uh, principle number two, and it's another single A guideline. So let's have a look at what this means in practice. So okay, we've got a very typical many of you guys watching these movies. They're all awesome. My favourite list of evil movie corporations because the X is all about corporate conspiracy. Um, very typical. You see this in a lot of blogs and whatnot. We've got uh, Tyrell Corporation, then we're going to find out more link, uh, link at the end, and then we've got you know, uh, Loon Industries, and then find out more at the end. You can see this a lot on websites. Visually, you can kind of connect those two things together, right? You can you can see the word and you can see the find out more next to it. But again, let's have a look at what a screen reader makes of this, right? Voice over on Safari for links so this one I'm going to use the a rotor. Oh, I'm going to use the rotor. Links menu. Oh, I'm going to use the voice over the visit link. Find out the visit link. Visit link. Find out more. So what I, I'm starting to lose faith in your progress at this point. What I'll do is jump out of the rotor. Um, let me 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 jump out of the rotor. Um, let me
really frustrating. You can imagine you losing use at this point, kind of ruining their day very easily. So let's turn accessible on. It's Jay. <laughs> Easy. Um, now what we're doing is, this is a, a recommended practice here. We're using the name of the uh, of the, the corporation we're talking about as the link. Same thing you do is if you want to say go on a bug holiday, you use bug holidays and they can sort of click here at the end, right? You'll often hear people saying this, but it never really makes sense. Now let's have a look at it. Voice over on Safari links menu. Ah. You are currently in a voice over on menu. There's it, there's it, there's it. You can figure out what each one of these things are. Currently, voice over on. Now you've got a happy user. So much more equitable experience. Um, so See. Obviously, human users can use your, your stuff on more effectively, use their quick nav kind of links. And also, generally, as a, as a visual user, it just makes more sense, it's just more usable. Um, this third one here, Mark is fit for purpose, for rule number three. Um, this is, I think, another double A. This is from the robust principle, if you remember, this is all about markup. For this one, we're going to introduce another pretty cool uh, voiceover shortcut here called screen curtain. I'll show you what this is in a minute. Right? So let's have a look uh, at these two buttons here. So I've used some CSS, I've made both these buttons look the same. Can't tell which one is which, right? I can hook these up with JavaScript, do all the kind of bish bosh and they both work exactly the same. Let's try this as a keyboard only user. Oh I've just missed that first button out entirely. Reason being is the first button's actually a spam. See this, can probably see this a few times in, in websites. Um, I, I'll admit I've probably done it in the past. Um, and the second button's actually a button, so let's see what a streamer really user does. Voice over on Safari for a user, no Safari containing window for a keyboard only user, screen curtain on Safari for a keyboard only user, only button is actually a button when interactive heading level one for a keyboard only for a keyboard only for a keyboard only interactive tab for. A, you are current. Keyboard only. You are uh, but as. Oh, I've done something wrong there. Hang on. Voice oh, over off. Anyway. Voice over on Safari. For a keyboard only user, only one button is actually a button window. Cross screen curtain on. Heading level 1. For a keyboard play like me. You are currently on a text element. So you can see there, with voice with screen count, we've turned the screen off. Uh, this is used uh, for screen users when they want a bit of privacy, but for us it's really great to emulate what it must feel like, right? So here... Printing level click me. You are currently on a text element. It says button, or it says text element, so I wouldn't know whether to click it or not. I'd be like, okay, I'll just go past that. Form not submitted. Click me button. You are currently on a button. To click this button, press control margin space. Conversely, the second one, it's given me what it is, and it's given me how to interact with it. So, Voice over off. not much of a better experience there, so it kind of brings that spec to life a little bit rather than just looking at it as an abstract thing. So yeah, you've got keyboard and use can navigate your content, you're forced to be more semantic, uh, and screen reader users get a better experience. There's a good one here, like our, our kind of last goal one here, colors have sufficient contrast. This is quite a woolly one, this is a double A one, uh, I think this is from, I guess, lost my notes here. Where is this from? You can tell how much of me work out, can you? Um, this is from Perceivable. Uh, so let's have a look. So here we have four buttons. Top two, I've, I've checked and I've made sure that these have sufficient contrast. The bottom two don't have sufficient contrast. But we can kind of make one of these out a little bit, maybe. That green one there. But let's use this really cool tool, this called Syndaltonism. Really, really hard to pronounce. But this uh, mimics uh, different types of uh, color blindness. You can pass a lens over your website. So you can kind of start to understand what it must feel like. So we've got different, I'm not going to try to pronounce these again. Try to know if you're trying to know me. So this one you see in monochrome. So if I pass this over these buttons here, now both this button to the company much invisible. So it really helps you to kind of keep those users in mind, tools like this. Um, so yeah, 
Benefits are colorblind users can read your content, but also if you're doing something like if you're making a UI for different train tickets, I've done this before, screen on a platform, it's bright sunlight, you can't see anything, then you're benefiting those users as well. If you're using your phone on low power mode, if you're using it with sunglasses, then you're just creating a better experience for everybody. Um, go through a quick, automated quick win here. So for this color contrast thing, uh, we've got this great talk with apps. If you um, look at our meetup group, we've got a talk um, my colleague David did a few weeks ago with automated testing. So he goes through a lot more stuff than this. We'll have a look at this one uh, test here. So if I open my apps extension here, it's just a, a Chrome extension. Press analyze. Oh, right away it's picked up. I've got two color contrast violations, right? It's also picked up an HTML uh, market validation. It's not going to pick up whether you're using the wrong tags, but it will pick up, or it will pick up some things, right? Um, and it, it even allows me to go to the button and see that it's there, it's there, that's the problem one. Right? Uh, if you're at the design stage, if you haven't got a website ready, you can use something like this, Leah Baru's uh, contrast tool. You can see, oh, fails. So even if you do a little sad face, which I really like, do a classic white on a black red or black text on a white background, way passes AAA level for size of text. So you can check some things with robots, which is, which is good to know. Um, so, oh, right, well, all that. It's already done. So yeah, we've, we've looked at our, our, looking at our two users here, we've kind of uh, checked off these two things now. We've gone, gone way, one way to do that. So we're at, we are, kind of understand what kind of user they are, and we can kind of replicate their experiences uh, using both WPEG2 in, in combination with screen readers in combination with our keyboard tone. Um, so, just about it. I'll leave you with this quote. This is from uh, Robin Christopherson. He's the head of digital illusion at Ability Net. He came to talk with us. That's Robin and uh, Tony, our tester, with the uh, guide dogs in the foyer there a few weeks ago. Said that we're going to remember that we're all tabs, we're all temporarily able bodied. So, something like we're all going to experience disability. So, when you kind of tempted to <laughs> discount some users, it's good to remember that. Um, and that's it. If you want to try this challenge again, Open the screen, I can show you how to get one on your phone. See if you can tell me that quote, that's it. <laughs>